Welcome everyone to our study group on Ernst Bloch and the principle of hope. Uh, we've given this uh, study group the title of Speculative Futures in the Warm Stream of Marxism. Um, I'm Daniel, it's very nice to host you all. Um, I'm pleased to uh, introduce our two facilitators of our four session study group on Bloch, um, Joshua Moore and Itai Farhi. Um, they are, uh, one is based, Joshua is based in the UK area off of an island, uh, which he can tell you more about that. Um, and Ita is based in San Francisco. Um, both of them um, studied at Kingston University at C-R-E-M-P. I think I, I may have messed that up. Uh, but the um, uh, Center for Research, what does the acronym stand for, Ita? Um It's uh, Center for Research in Modern European Philosophy. It's a long one. Center for Research in Modern European Philosophy. Fabulous program. Um, both of them did their masters together. That's where they met. And both have a strong interest in German idealism um, and in Bloch. So we're super stoked to have them uh, moderate this. Since our group is called Study Groups uh, on Psychoanalysis and Politics, one of the angles we do want to kind of home in on with Bloch is his treatment of psychoanalysis and the principle of hope. He develops uh, a long kind of critique of Freudianism, critique of Jungianism, and he obviously develops this sort of theory, which is arguably the most important theory or concept of the not yet conscious, which we, we, we certainly want to pick apart uh, in particular, at least I do. And that's gonna be the focus of session two. Um, and we have a bunch of rich readings in store for you. Um, and we're very excited that you, that you uh, are gonna join us. Today, Joshua Moore is going to lead the discussion. And without further ado, happy to hand the floor over to Joshua. Thanks, um, thanks Dan. Yeah, it's, um, it's, um, it's pretty great to be here. Um, uh, Dan said I'd tell you a little bit more about um, where I'm based at the moment. It's, uh, it's a little island uh, called Guernsey. Um, uh, it's uh, it's uh, part of um, the Channel Islands, so I don't know if you've heard of those, um, but it's a small island for about sort of 60,000 people, um, and it's really not very big at all. Um, but yeah, I think... Um, I think we should just go straight into the presentation. I'm going to share my um, screen so that you can see the presentation. So please let me know if you can all um, see it. Can you see that? Can you all see the uh, presentation? Yep. Great. Yeah, okay. Great. Thank you. Thank you. Sorry, uh, John, I didn't see the thumbs up. Cool. Um, so the title of this uh, session is uh, an introduction to Bloch's thought um, and his confrontation with fascism. Um, fascism, um, the fascism of the um, sort of uh, 1930s and 40s and and, um, and and sort of, well, just of, of course, just around that time in general, um, is really sort of like the context, um, uh, sort of, the, you know, sort of the main historical context that Bloch is writing in. So um, Ita and I thought that it was quite good to um, maybe just um, sort of be conscious of that context. Um, I just thought I'd just uh, go through some basic biographical points. Um, so uh, Bloch was born in um, 1885 in uh, Ludwigshafen. Um, he made um, some quite significant friendships with um, some sort of big players in the uh, Marxist and sort of sociological sort of, uh, sociology context. Um, he was quite close with uh, George Lukács, um, ended up uh, following Lukács to uh, Heidelberg in uh, 1912, where uh, both of them became part of the um, circle around Max uh, Weber. Um, and Bloch also developed a friendship with Adorno um, in the sort of 1920s. But um, all of these connections um, were sort of challenged due to Bloch's um, sort of subjectivism, his um, toying with mysticism, um, his um, sort of writings on Messianism and, and so on. These are all seen as quite sort of unorthodox aspects of Marxism. The um, text that we're going to be focusing on, in fact, well, all of the texts that we are going to be um, focusing on were uh, written in the 1930s um, 
um, whilst Block was in exile, um, at first in uh, Switzerland and then uh, later on in America. Um, Block moved to America in uh, 1938 along with some members of the Frankfurt School and it's uh, in America that Block wrote um, the uh, Principle of, of, uh, of Hope. Um, but this wasn't published until 1954, uh, by which time Block had uh, moved to um, East Germany, taking up position of Chair of Philosophy at the University of uh, Leipzig. Um, but Block eventually um, uh, left his position and left East Germany, and this was largely due to because um, of his um, sort of disagree. well, uh, largely due to the fact that his, um, so I guess the difference in Bloch's thoughts is sort of the, the party, uh, sort of the Soviet sort of doctrine, I guess. Um, um, so, so the problematic that um, Bloch is grappling with, um, that's going to shape um, his thought at the time is um, is the question of you know how can we explain the emergence of fascism in the 1930s, um, and at the same time this is um, this is also to ask how is it that Marxism did not grip the masses instead? So these questions are like two sides of the same coin. I hope that makes sense. Um, so Bloch's I guess initial answer to the question, or at least one of his um, um, uh, at least one of his main responses to this question is the idea that there are um, contradictions to capitalism that are not uh, imminent to capitalism itself, um, or not, or at least you know they're not created by capitalism itself. They, to an extent, um, precede capitalism. So um, hopefully you're kind of familiar with the idea, the sort of the Marxist idea that capitalism has its own contradictions. Um, for Bloch, the only way that, um, well, one of the ways that we could explain fascism is the, with the idea that there are uh, contradictions to capitalism that um, are not going to be um, immediately or necessarily correlated to the proletariat's uh, movement. And, um, and these are contradictions whose sort of subjective um, expression is sort of felt in sort of the non-proletarian classes, so um, the peasantry, for example, the German peasantry, um, and also the petty, uh, sort of, uh, the petty uh, bourgeoisie also. And um, for Bloch, these uh, classes are going to be sort of, I guess, um, sort of suggestible to the narratives of fascism. Um, you know, largely, you know, and this is largely because they don't have this um, sort of necessary relationship to, um, or necessarily sort of correlation to the um, to the proletarian uh, movements. And um, these contradictions for Bloch uh, include, um, I mean, he's, I mean, he's, he's, I guess he's, I mean, it's, it's not always entirely clear as to what he means, but when he, he gives the examples of house, soil and people. So um, I think we might see this as the kind of um, desire for, um, you know, sort of uh, shelter, belonging, um, a sense of place uh, and a sense of community, which are to a certain extent sort of transhistorical um, desires. Um, and but in each sort of period of history, um, I guess with feudalism in, in the case of the peasantry and also um, with the petty bourgeoisie, capitalism has, you know, these social uh, relations, these social forms have failed to satiate or meet these desires or these demands. And so uh, for Bloch, um, because they're quite, the sense of, well, the sense in which they're suggested to fascism is the um, sense in which um, their contradictions can be, um, can be sort of um, appeased, I guess, or, or met somehow through like atavistic myth, myths. So equally, um, sort of, what he uses as non-synchronistic non, uh, non non sort of non um, ideas um, and ideologies. And uh, for Bloch, this is going to require um, a more complex idea of, of dialectics. Um, to what is being offered by 
um, the Marxists of the time. And Bloch describes this kind of dialectics as a multispatial and multi-temporal dialectics, um, dialectics with polyrhythm and counterpoint. And um, the transition to the, uh, I guess, to a post-capitalist society that these um, contradictions um, warrant is going to be irreducible to, I guess, the the forms and the um, um, and the ideas sort of generated by. Um, I guess clear cut concepts, right? Um, and sort of objective knowledge. It's it's, it's going to signal it's, it's going to be what, what Bloch describes as sort of a matter of the non-contemplative. And this is really about um I guess a certain sense a certain level of like unobjectifiability. So a certain um inability to formulate or um reduce this process to um, sort of clear-cut um, forms or, a, or sort of a universalizable knowledge. It's going to be um, a matter of subjectivism, right? So this, this is going to sort of lead us quite nicely into some of the uh, sort of Bloch's interest around expressionism. Um, So, the, you know, the expressionists are, are to a certain extent, um, well, they're largely dealing with this, um, this sub subjectivism. Um, and, and you know, it's, I mean, it's in the name, you know, this um, expression of these subjective um, aspects. And um, expressionism for Bloch is about, um, for him, um, unlike, I guess, his um, contemporaries like Lukács, who are reducing the subjectivism of, um, of expressionism to um, a sort of problematic ideology specific to capitalism. For Bloch, it's going to signify um, this um, transition to the new that's um, non-contemplative or irreducible to what we will see as being sort of defined as a contemplative um, knowledge. Um, I don't want to linger on this too much. We can come back to it, um, I think, if um, if there are sort of specific questions about it. But I just want to maybe um, go straight into um, the principle of hope and how the principle of hope picks this up. Um, because the principle of hope sort of generalizes this idea um, of an incompleted past. Um, and it sort of, it, it, it transforms it into the idea that these sort of, what I described as a, these transhistorical desires, that might not be the best way to put it, but um, um, it, it sort of gives us the idea that there is this um, striving within, throughout human history towards uh, perfection and, and an overcoming of the subject-object conflicts. Now, you know, obviously that's not unprecedented. That's, um, you know, this is largely the narrative of German idealism, but for Bloch, um, most of sort of German idealism, whether it's uh, Schelling or Hegel, uh, is marked by a certain resignation. Um, and um, but for Bloch, um, hope uh, is not just you know. Uh, well, for Bloch, um, history largely uh, moves through um, hope and utopian uh, ambitions. And and for Bloch, this these this these utopian ambitions and um, this hope um, will never sort of accept any kind of resignation. It will just keep going. Um, but the reason why um, utopia may um, appear to be so sort of problematic for Marxism, um, um, for Bloch, the utopias that we usually have a problem with, or um, the pejorative sense of utopianism, um, is is um, A utopianism that's abstract, right? So, and it, um, so you know, for Marx, the problem with utopianism is that it overlooks uh, historical conditions. The utopian socialists, for example, um, were writing at a time where the proletariat wasn't fully um, self-conscious or fully um, developed as a class or organized as a class, and so they sort of made up for this. Um, I guess for this, uh, they sort of supplemented this um, 
um, with their sort of blueprint systems. I mean, for block the systems themselves are not so problematic, but they're uh, the reason why they're so abstract is because they um, are what he describes as the utopian function, this drive. Um, um, you know, they sort of express this drive or this function, uh, but um, in a way that sort of blocks, right? This 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 drive gets sort of blocked, and 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 and, and like, as I sort of have alluded to, it it gets blocked through sort of underdeveloped or underdeveloped um, conditions. Right, you know, Marx often sort of talks about the necessity for mature conditions or uh, propitious conditions of some kind. Um, the other way that um, this utopian function gets blocked and becomes abstract and um, um, I guess unrealistic is through uh, class interest and ideology. Um, and um, this utopianism for Bloch as well, um, this utopian function, as he describes it, is um, it's not just going to be about, um, I guess, uh, ideal future societies. It's, it's going to be generalized to include um, uh, anticipation in general. So any kind of going beyond um, what is given, um, what has already become. And for Bloch, this utopian uh, function, as he describes it, this, this drive is to a certain extent uh, indomitable, right? It, it, to a certain extent, it's, it's always going to be there. It's always going to strive so long as it's possible to do so. So long as it doesn't have um, a reason to resign itself. And I say itself, I'm, I'm talking about it impersonally. It, it really is largely about us. Um, Humanity for Bloch is going to self-fulfill the absolute's own drive towards this. It's quite, um, I admit it's quite a, an outlandish claim, which we will um, sort of explore more uh, throughout these sessions. Um, um, but for Bloch, um, as soon as the utopian gets, uh, gets blocked, as soon as this utopian function gets blocked, then um, a surplus will remain and the surplus can basically get relayed and get picked up like a, like a kind of relay, I guess is maybe an appropriate way to think of it. Um, but it will involve um, sort of returning, I guess, to uh, history, returning to um, uh, the cultures of the history. Maybe, you know, the canon, for example. Um, whether that's for whether that's you know the kind of philosophy or literature um, or art. Um. So, so I so, so the way that the, 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 the reason why the humanity and uh, human activity is so. Um, uh, has this role in, in relation to, to the absolute. It's, it's largely due to um, consciousness. Um, a lot of the German idealists and also um, thinkers like Spinoza, sort of maybe less so Spinoza, but certainly uh, um, a lot of the German idealists have this idea that um, human self-consciousness is um, the absolute becoming self-conscious. And, and this is kind of no less with Bloch, actually. Uh, but we will see that um, this this human consciousness, this um, which um, is uh, also going to be about an educated hope. It's going to belong to this educated hope. I've included this quote here about um, an, uh, about this utopian function being an unfinished. Um, well, this the sort of I guess the the um, this drive or this process within reality being described as an unfinished law governed field of becoming. Uh, um, which, which I think is you know, quite an interesting way to put it. Um, for Bloch, um, as we will see, um, the importance of the non-contemplative is to a certain extent the idea that um, um, reality is not determined in, in, in any way by like a fixed essence. But nevertheless, there is this sort of tendency, I guess, uh, towards um, betterment and ultimately um, uh, subject object unity um and i think that's that's sort of this like uh, for blog the sense in which it is law governed i guess uh, but I, I i just think this is quite an interesting idea that um perhaps we might want to question um also just by the way uh, please feel free to interrupt me at any 
uh, time. Um, because um, the way that I'm sharing this um, slideshow, I can't actually see if you um, put your thumbs up or anything. So please shout. Um, I think um, it's really important to um, to point out that um, the non-contemplative, um, the idea of the future and the new uh, for Bloch, um, like the sort of theoretical, um, the, the, the arguments for this for Bloch are already kind of accomplished by Marx. Bloch doesn't really, it seems to me that Bloch doesn't really feel the need to justify his assumption of this, of the new uh, so much. Um, uh, Bloch actually says himself, um, the new philosophy, as it was initiated by Marx, is the same thing as the philosophy of the new. Um, so, you know, Bloch is not relying on Nietzsche here, right? He's, he's not relying on any of these, um, on, on any other sort of philosopher of, or, of becoming or philosopher of the future. Um, for Bloch, it's, it, it all comes down to Marx. And so um, I think we should maybe just see, see what that means, where that comes from. Um, I think I think this largely, so, you know, you may, um, if you've read the introduction to the principle of hope, you may have seen, um, you may recall Bloch um, uh, talking with the theme of like the active and the passive. Um, and this, this is also a theme in, 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 a, in Marxist thesis on Feuerbach. I was going to maybe um, go into that a little bit more. We, we can do if you want, but I, I think um, I want to maybe focus on what, um, what I think is really at stake in this and what I think is really um, important about this. And um, the thesis on Feuerbach um, start, be, or begin with this uh, sentence. The chief defect of all previous materialism is that things, reality, sensuousness, are conceived only in the form of the object or of contemplation, but not as sensuous human activity practice, not subjectively. So there are two words in here that I've, I've put in square brackets. I've, I've, uh, the original German for, um, for well, well, what is translated as things, this uh, is uh, Gegenstand. This is usually, Gegenstand is usually translated as an uh, object. Um, and, and, and what's translated as object in here is also translated as object. I'm sorry. Uh, <laughs> The German object here is also often translated as object indiscriminately. So it's it, so when you're reading through um, a lot of translations of German philosophy, um, it's often um, impossible to to sort of know that there's this um, difference, I guess, within the within the text. But in in in, um, in German philosophy, um, at least um, sort of especially in in Hegel, although. Um, Arguably, this uh, distinction is um, quite significant um, to Kant's um, philosophy. Uh, Gegenstand tends to be um, on the side of the sub on the side of the subjective, and on the side of um, becoming, uh, and it's about um, it's usually about an encounter with uh, reality or um, or a problem, which then has to be uh, worked through. Um, it has to be, I guess, theorized, form, uh, formulated, and sort of transformed eventually into the object. And the object is what, in English, we would usually, you know, call the uh, so sort of think of in terms of like objective, universal knowledge. So this, um, so it, it's not about uh, reducing the object to the uh, Gegenstand. It's it really, I think, what's important for Marx is that within human history there's a dialectic between the two you know I, I don't think marx is denying that there's such a thing as like um identities in reality um as such um but i think really it's about the fact that these uh, identities these forms uh or fixities are, are revisable so human activity um is so to you know to a certain extent irreducible to the object like once and for all does that make sense? Does anybody have any questions about that?
Okay. So, because block, sorry. One thing oh. I think. Uh, sorry, this is this is Daniel. Um, I I really think this is uh, reminiscent of um, Etienne Balibar's uh, short book on Marx. Also makes this observation that um, the strain of humanist uh, Marxists, Marxist humanists, uh, really do. Uh, locate the thesis on Feuerbach as the pivotal pivotal discovery of Marx, right? Whereas a lot of kind of value form or scientific Marxists will locate capital. And I think that's very significant for Bloch as a kind of think a, a Marxist. And we can talk about Bloch's humanism at some point. It's probably more complicated even than Lukács' humanism. But nonetheless, uh, this pinpointing of Marx's um, discovery of a certain type of dialectic, which would be um, something different in the history of German idealism than what was uh, prior to thesis on Feuerbach proposed about the unification of subject and object, right? And, um, and I think with that, there is also a new uh, thesis on materialism precisely because Feuerbach saw himself as a materialist. So Marx is proposing a, 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 a more uh, rigorous form of materialism. So I like what you're doing here with the analysis of these terms in this way. Um, and um, you also see this obviously in Bloch's book on Marx as well. He really wants to pinpoint thesis on Feuerbach. And it is frankly interesting as an aside, I don't know if you all agree how um, seldom the subjective side, I don't even want to say humanist side because we're long past that, but even Marxists today who come to the body of Marx's thought and wish to stake down an interest in the subjective side of Marx, it's kind of um, rare a bit for that type of study on Marx. So I think that um, that would be interesting for us to talk about as well. like what accounts for that decline in interest, I would say, in the subject of Marx. Um, the other thing I wanted to say briefly on your opening thing on non-synchronicity is how really nice that concept is. And I'd love for us to just sort of just talk about that at some later point, because I, I would love for you to also to continue. But um, what I mean by that is, you know, as I read the, the essay there, you know, um, what he's really talking about is the way that non-synchronicity is, is a type of response to Lukacian reification. So non-synchronicity is the way that the human experiences a split or dual temporality with the past by virtue of a kind of terminal, by virtue of the fact that they become a thing effectively, right? So the process of becoming a thing, becoming a commodity, selling your labor power, produces this non-synchronicity for which you can almost have a taxonomy, similar to like Badiou's taxonomy of different subject positions, right? Um, and that's what Bloch studies, is like the different ways that proletariat responds, the different ways petty bourgeoisie responds, the different way bourgeoisie responds, and the way that fascism responds um, is a perfect solution to this. Like the myth is a perfect solution to the alleviation of the splitness. You know what I'm saying? And it actually does remind me quite a lot actually of um, a Jew's definition of fascism as what he calls the obscure subject. Precisely because the obscure subject as you probably know from Logics of Worlds is the figure who um, read like, um, um, brings a an emblem or a kind of model from the past onto the onto their alienation in the present, right? And kind of mm -hmm. plug, plugs that um, crisis there. And I was also thinking not to be this is very wild. I shouldn't even say this, but you know the um, Pierre Bourdieu, the French sociologist that many Marxists dislike. I think that's a mistake, but. Um, he has a beautiful concept 
that is very similar to non-synchronicity, what it calls hysteresis, which mm -hmm. very much is similar, I think, to, to non-synchronicity, which is a kind of hystericizing um, that capitalism does on the body as well. So the, I really think non-synchronicity is a theory of what the body undergoes through reification and how the body then treats time, the category of time differently. And then from that, you can kind of analyze different ways that that takes place uh, amongst the class, um, the layers of class. Is that, is that a fair analysis, would you say, Josh? Um, yeah, I mean, there's, there's, lot, uh, yeah, I think there's like a lot to un unpack there that I, that I would love to sort of um, meditate upon. I mean, I guess one thought that um, came to mind is that you talked about how um, myth, um, to a certain extent, um, unifies this split, as you as you talked about. I, I can't remember the exact words you used. I'm, I'm, I'm sorry. You might have said, said decision or some kind of um, contradiction or tension. Um, this is something that um, in in the uh, um, we'll see in the principle of hope, um, this is taken up and um, and dealt with in terms of um, a kind of um, like for, for block these these tensions, these splits always um, indicate or belong to a process or some kind of transition. Right. And, and the split is usually and, and it is temporal. It's about um, a, the difference between, you know, what has become already. Um, and or and you know what is going, what you know what is what is becoming. I guess yeah. the the new is about the front. It's about a juncture. Yeah. Whenever you whenever you see the word front um, in uh, in the principle of hope, just think juncture. This is what Block is talking about. And wait, and for wait, Block, wait, wait. say that again. I'm sorry. What was the term? Uh, whenever you see the front, I, I forget what the German um, is. Uh -huh. I'm sorry. Uh -huh. uh, but whenever you see whenever you see that, um, you should think in terms of like a juncture, huh. like. Um, a kind of join, a joining, um, I guess, of, of the uh, what has already become, um, yeah. and you know what is uh, becoming. And and for Bloch, what is um, so significant about the human with respect to uh, the absolute is that the human is um, is that aspect of the absolute um, that um, it, like the human is basically the vanguard of matter in process. Mm. So it's the human consciously. Um, is or maybe, maybe not is, but uh, certainly um, faces or is aware of this uh, mm. front, and and for and for block the front or this juncture um, is exactly um, this theory of practice. But I don't want to deter from from your point, Daniel, about the, the myth um, as yeah, kind of. I have a, I have a nice little thing. He says he says quote the nihilism of bourgeois life, this becoming a commodity, becoming alienated from the entire world shows preserved non-synchronisms in a doubly natural way and preserved nature in a doubly magical way. And so campfires and sacrificial smoke burn in the people's hall, trumpets yeah. blast announcing the fear in a more than Wilhelmian manner. The thin little gardens of ideology that falsify the myth become materially mm -hmm. overheated and spring up. Yeah. A frenzied middle class into a jungle. So, um, it's a really nice way to, to, to elucidate uh, how myth precisely is a response to um, reification. And then again, I don't know, even the category of contemplation means something different for Marx than it does for Lukács. Because by the time Bloch is writing, and you know, when they, they were younger, when they were younger and they were their comrades, there was a beautiful saying that Lukács and um, Bloch they would they would go to parties and they would people couldn't tell what they were saying apart from one another and they would finish each other's sentences right yeah so they yeah. were literally like on the same wavelength mm -hmm. but what i think for for maybe it deserves some elucidations here because what when um Lukács talks about contemplation he's talking about uh a fundamental worldview of the bourgeoisie right which is mm -hmm. its incapacity for praxis its incapacity to enter into uh, a mode of active transformation of the world and a deprivation of the absolute and so on and so forth, which is different, I think, than what Marx means in Feuerbach. I don't know if you wanted to say more about that or... Um, yeah, I mean, I'm sort of less familiar with Lukács. Itai might um, have um, something to say about that. Um... 
Do you have any, do you have anything on that, Isai? Um, I wonder if this is the best point to intervene on Lukacs, or maybe you should um, finish out what you wanted to say, and then maybe Lukacs will come back later in the yeah, discussion. Yeah, for sure. Okay. Cool. All right. Well, yeah. Um, let, let's certainly come back to that point because uh, it is, you know, significant to blocks context. But we will also go. Um, uh, we also will touch upon um, this idea of uh, well, the role of, of myth and, and how it relates to uh, reification. Because in a way, we could say that what Block is getting at here is a reification in of the imagination, right? A kind of preemptive uh, completion of some kind um, that myth, or I guess some kind of preemptive sort of coherence that that myth uh, provides um so yeah i mean this this quote is really just to um i, I don't think i need to read it out um but it, it, i just really wanted to emphasize the extent to which the new and, and becoming a reality is not um is really going to be a matter of of, of the human um you know and a kind of sort of um I would describe it. An inorganic materiality certainly precedes the human. Bloch is not really denying that, but Bloch does think that its movement, the movement of um, nature, natural history, is slow. It's like very slow. Uh, whereas for Bloch, the human achieves um, these, you know, the kind of um, very significant um, transformations of, of, of matter and, and material through consciousness and labor at quite a fast rate. Um, so when Bloch is talking about the new, it's really, um, you know, when we talk about the, the new in relation to sort of human history, it really is about the um, humans, um, I guess, theory, theory practice, oh, and, and, you know, praxis, right? So I just wanted to emphasize that point. Um, um, so there are two gaps in Marxism, right? So even though Marx discovers the new and, and, this, and, and this philosophy of the new, um, there are two gaps that that uh, block is concerned, and then this is this is perhaps uh, going to relate to uh, the points about Lukacs. Um, what we were saying about Lukacs, it might be um, a good time to to talk about that um, in a bit. But um, there are, um, I'd say, the two gaps that that block is concerned with. There's a subjective aspect to this gap, um, and uh, there is uh, an objective aspect to this gap. And the problem for block within uh, Marxism, and this is not Marx. Right, this is Marxism. I think Bloch does imply a certain um, limits um, to Marx um, himself, but uh, this is largely about Marxism, right? Uh, Bloch says that, you know, for Marxism, uh, he says intending is not heard in its characteristic anticipating tone. <coughs> and this is largely to do with what Bloch describes as the importance of the subjective factor, um, which for Bloch has to be hopeful. And this hope, this utopian drive, for, for Bloch, every revolutionary, he, he says here, all freedom movements are guided by utopian aspirations. And for Bloch, these, these utopian aspirations are irreducible to narratives, narratives about false consciousness. And I think this, this is where Bloch differs from Lukács slightly. Um, but I think this subjective factor for Bloch as well, it has to have the right balance of concreteness and abstractness. It has to be like, like, like for Bloch, like, Mar uh, like Marxism is, is right to identify the proletariat as like the most sort of propitiously sort of historically conditioned subject, right? It has like class consciousness and, and, and it certainly, um, you know, it, it, it certainly is the leader, right? And when, when, when in, even in the uh, non-synchronism essay, Bloch is talking, Bloch says that the only way these sort of non-synchronous sort of contradictions can really have a sort of true resolve is through uh, the cause of the proletariat, right? So it's got sort of similar to Lenin in, in, in that point, although um, that might be a little bit of a tangent, but um, um, I guess for Bloch, if we go too far in the direction of this, of, of emphasizing these historical conditions and emphasizing historical concreteness, then, when, then we will end up um, being like uh, Kautsky um, and uh, the problem at least um, in Marxism, you may have heard the idea of like uh, the vulgar Marxists or, or economic determinists. I mean, determinism, I don't think is really um, a problem within Marxism per se. It's, it's more the issue, the sort of the Kautsky idea of this, which is all about sort of inevitability. I think it's different to determinism. Um, although that is quite a big, um, I think, philosophical problematic that we might not want to 
delve into too far. Um, I'll just go into um, what Bloch sees as the objective gap. Um, so he says um, the problem with Marxism now is, uh, or his Marxism of his time is that objective tendency is not recognized in its characteristic anticipatory powerfulness. For Bloch, materialism that like implied and sort of implicit in Marxism and um, and as, as Daniel uh, thankfully sort of alluded to with um, there's a new Marxism uh, there's a new materialism uh, with Marx and uh, and a lot of the um, explications of this new materialism don't really um, don't really get at what's new about it, it, it you know um, you know it often doesn't really sound very much like um, doesn't really sound that much different to the kind of um, Old materialism that Marx was sort of trying to grapple with, and then and this um, and and this this new materialism that that, that Bloch thinks um, is is so important um, is going to be a materialism that uh, makes the subjective factor that makes the uh, non synchronous contradictions, um, you know, the and the idea of the incompleted past for, for Bloch, this new materialism is, is going to be what makes what is what makes these um aspects intelligible right and Bloch describes this um this new concept of, of of matter he says um its space is the objectively real possibility within process along the path of the object again gegenstand in which what is radically intended by man is not delivered anywhere but not thwarted anywhere either right so you know there is a certain level of, of indifference um, to sort of human subjectivity to an extent. Um, you know um, nothing is guaranteed. You know the intentions of the human and everything are not guaranteed to be realised. Um, but Bloch thinks that so long as um, so long as there is such a thing as human labour and human history, um, humanity will uh, strive eventually. That there will be problems along the way. Uh, but humanity will uh, strive towards uh, betterment. But I just wanted to um, touch upon uh, two significant words here. There's um, or terms. There's real possibility, um, which is going to be about um, which which block is going to understand in terms of Aristotelian or Aristotle's concept of like potentiality or uh, or dunamis. Um, and this potentiality is, or this this sort of process, um, is about a, it's, it's going to be understood by Bloch as as kind of dialectic between the form and the formless, like form and formlessness. And form is going to be about uh, objectifiable possibilities, like uh, all the possibilities that um, are. You know, I get like if we, if we look if we look at the world and and we you know we look how things behave, um, you know, empirically we might um, um, come well through, through empirical knowledge we might um, come up with like a theory of like what is possible, right? Um, but for Bloch, there are possibilities beyond that, right? Like you know, uh, logical or not logical, but sort of like um, uh, possibility. The, the sort of concept of possibility that's uh, oriented towards what has already become, like what is what is um, what, what has been formed <laughs> uh, in, in the world, like you know, based on actuality. As um, for Bloch, you know, there's always like a retrospective aspect to that. Like things have already become, and then we look back, and then we base sort of what is possible on that. For Bloch, there are um, unprecedented possibilities. I have to be careful when I use the word unprecedented because we are dealing with dialectics here. And um, when we're dealing with dialectics, nothing should technically be um, absolutely uh, unprecedented. Um, but then again, I also wanted to emphasize, um, you know, the what Bloch describes as the path of the object, which again, that's Gegenstand. And as I said before, Gegenstand is it's really about um, the, the, the it, it kind of literally um, translates, I think, uh, correct me someone if I'm wrong, I think it translates as a stand against. Um, and, and it really is about an, an encounter, so any, you know, um, and, uh, and sort of a problem that has to be uh, sort of developed, processed. It, it has connotations with labour, right, with working here and, and working upon something. And, 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 um, and again, this, um, this, this new materialism 
which we're going to um, talk more about uh, in session three um, and, and the readings for session three. It's really, um, again, it's, it's not just about, you know, it, well, it's about making um, intelligible this, um, this multi-temporal, multi-spatial uh, dialectic, sort of dialectic, which is materialist as well, so technically a dialectical materialism. Um, and so with, with all that in mind, um, we, can, we can maybe pause um, for questions and, and um, uh, in, in a bit, but with all that in, in, in mind, Bloch, Bloch makes this uh, statement. So, so bearing in mind Marx's you know, philosophy of the new and the gaps uh, within it, he then concludes, since Marx, no research into truth and no realistic judgment is possible at all, which will be able to avoid the subjective and objective hope contents of the world without paying the penalty of triviality or reaching a dead end. This is the big sentence. Right? Philosophy will have conscience of tomorrow, commitment to the future, knowledge of hope, or it will have no more knowledge. Later on, we're going to, um, hopefully if we have time, we're going to touch upon this concept of educated hope. Um, Bloch will sometimes use the Latin uh, Dr. Spes. Um, Bloch himself translates that as um, comprehended possibility. I, I can't remember the exact gem for comprehension, but it, um, it, it has uh, relations to the word Bercliff, which is about concept. Um, and anyone who's interested in Hegel will know that this uh, Bercliff is, is um, which is a very significant word within <laughs> Hegelian philosophy. Um, um, so yeah, before we go into the sort of this slide and what is hope, does anybody have any um, questions? And, and and again, please um, please could you um, turn off your uh, turn on your microphone because um, I am going to sort of um, so long as I have the slides up, I can't actually see if anybody puts their hands up. <laughs> I mean, if there are no questions, we can I can uh, move on. I guess okay? one, I have one comment. Um, maybe we could talk a little bit about why the category of the future is significant in 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 the context of Bloch's Marxism of his time. We could say the 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 kind of um, the various kind of dogmatic forms of Marxism that he was finding around him, scientific socialism, certain kind of post-Leninist strains within the Soviet Union. Um, for him, uh, we're rejecting some truths of Hegel. So there's a kind of strong, as far as I understand, Hegelian argument at play, which is having to do with um, the, 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 the idea that Hegel is incomplete, but it is incomplete in a way that's different than what the Soviet Marxist um, intelligentsia was arguing. Um, so for him, um, obviously, Hegel needs to be supplemented because Hegelian futurity or like the concept of the future for Hegel is always premised on anamnesis and that a thesis of anamnesis is not like revolutionary enough. Uh, because it doesn't leave open this zone of possibility and so on, right? And mm -hmm. uh, it, th it therefore makes sense why expressionism is interesting to Bloch, uh, because expressionism is about spontaneity and chance and kind of this sort of um, entering into the new and so on, and the present. And I think that um, he wants to say something also about how uh, revolutionary praxis is not fut futural. It's often actually the only thing that's very presentist in a certain sense. Like that's why he's interested in messianic movements because he actually sees them as like super imminent to the present that they actually can think the present better than any other form of being in the world through the revolt, it seems to me. So yeah, there's this kind of focus on the future, but there's also something within praxis that is a better grasp of the present, it seems to me. Yeah, I mean, the, per the present is really, um, sorry, just, was someone else about to talk? Yeah, please. Anybody can jump in at any time.
Well, okay. So the um this this idea of the, of the present, I think, is is quite interesting in Block. Block um says um later on, I do have the quote somewhere. Um, in fact, it's 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 here. <laughs> so uh, this is convenient. Um, Block says everybody lives in the future because they strive. Past things only come later, and as yet, genuine present is almost never there at all. So I think this is quite an interesting uh, idea. The, the present, I think, for Bloch is so, um, you know, I, I think it really is about um, uh, sort of becoming. I mean, we have to be careful because um, otherwise we're going to make, you know, we have to be careful not to make Bloch sound like a sort of a Deleuzean. I, I don't think he is. Um, I think, you know, there are identities, there are things that are formed, um, that things, you know, things are genuinely sort of like formed themselves in reality, but they are also in the process of revising themselves. And, and, and what's most significant for Bloch is that which is um, revising itself a little bit uh, faster, I guess. Um, but, you know, I guess for Bloch, it, it's, it's really the subjective um, experience, which, um, you know, isn't really um, interested in the genuine present. And, 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 um, and, and this can be problematic, right? Bloch talks about how hope has to be regulated and um, and as we will see, um, uh, as as we will see as as I sort of go on um, with, with the presentation, and and also we will hopefully um, understand this a little bit better uh, um, um, for the you know from the later sessions. But um, there's this um, for block. What is necessary is to mediate our hope with the present um, and. Um, and you know, to to be able to you know dream up a better world and and um, and and hope for a better future, but at the same time, what that needs to be paired with a kind of um, cold sort of analysis of what's going on. Um, you know, we have to be we have to understand historical conditions. If we try to realize an ideal or or without understanding our you know sort of the historical conditions, then um, you know reality might not be ready for that ideal and it could end in disaster right um i think um i think the history of the soviet union is, is a bit more complex than than this but to a certain extent we might you know i think I, I think people often will give the example of the soviet union um and um and, and communism in russia um when when sort of talking about what underdeveloped conditions might look like but um the the, the example that marx often gives is of um sort of um uh, uh, Babuism, like Babuf, the um, the um, I think he was one of the uh, Jacobins, right? Um, who um, at least Marx talks about as the um, uh, first thinker, I guess, of, of communism. And um, for Marx, um, the early communists, um, because there was not a proletariat uh, um, that was fully sort of developed, these um, Communists uh, try to sort of lead um, or, or try to realize uh, communism um, through, um, I guess, you know, like a kind of with the idea of like a purchase revolution, like they would just um, storm, but eventually sort of like inspire some sort of um, 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 like purchase revolution of some kind, which which would be to um, overthrow uh, the government somehow, just um, um with with i guess with the help of um um sort of members of their own class um which obviously was going to would, would end in disaster um and even if they were successful um it would incur its own problems i guess with with democracy and, and other things um i feel like i'm rounding a little bit but um but where um where sort of are you are you uh, talking are you talking about the 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 conspiracy the conspiracy of the, the yes yeah yeah, exactly. yeah 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 that, that was interesting though but Babouf, that that figure he was actually of bourgeoisie and he was standing in solidarity with proletariat yeah and that's I mean, actually so what the the interesting thing about J jacobin uh, uh praxis was itself like which which Marx will later actually criticize in a certain way, which was they 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 ended up becoming the dupes of the interests of the pro of the bourgeoisie without 
knowing it, even though the actions of the Jacobin revolutionaries were in a kind of cross-class solidarity. But it always yeah. tended to be in the French Revolution that the kind of bourgeois saviors were standing as kind of even in Robespierre as well. So there is that yeah. interesting dynamic. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. I mean, for I think for Marx, the problem was that um, you know, um these uh these uh these sort of bourgeois sort of um um sort of ambassadors of, of communism didn't really see um you know, they, they saw the masses, right? they, they didn't, I, I don't, I don't think they really had a concept of the proletariat as such, they, um, but, but if they did, they, they saw the proletariat as, um, or the masses, um, as, you know, sort of passive, they, they didn't, they, you know, they would, they would, their life was too awful to have time to think morally, or, or to be able to act uh, morally, and to be able to act uh, in the interest of this, of, of them, of what, to be able to truly act in the interest of themselves. Yeah, um, and and you know Marx completely completely sort of like um, well Marx doesn't actually disagree with it, he, but he does say that um, that you know the masses have to be um, or the proletariat um, has to um, you know develop a class consciousness right where um, it is able to you know there are the conditions are in place in which it can um, do that and 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 the early Marx the Marx of like eighteen forty four and the Paris manuscripts will talk about the proletariat as having sort of like a certain, developing a certain level of morality. Mm -hmm. um, but yeah, um, but, but going to what you were saying about how uh, the sort of like these, uh, the non-synchronous non aspect in to a certain extent might have, um, might come into contact with the present um, more significantly than, um, I don't know, sort of cold analysis of what's going on. There's there some truth to that, to the extent that, um, um, you know, the, as I, as I said before, you know, you know, the present is about a process and, and, and the way that this, the, um, and the way that sort of reality, um, I guess what keeps this process going is, um, is an, a, a past potentiality that has not been exhausted. Mm. It's kind of a little bit like Heidegger in, in that sense. Like there's, there's, you, you may have sort of, you know, this, this idea that, um, that, um, that past things only come later. Like this is all quite, it comes very close to Heideggerian ex existentialism here, and um, and this this might be a good a good time to sort of talk about hope, because um, hope um and what Bloch describes as expectant emotions, and uh, we will go into the not yet conscious in a bit, um, but this pre-conscious um aspect of of the, of the human um sort of cognizes these unformed uh, possibilities and potentialities um. And for Bloch, where this is, um, in his words, unthwarted, um, um, it contains only hope. So similar to uh, how in Heidegger, you know, there was this idea of like the mood and, and or the, in, in German it's Stimmung, um, especially angst for Heidegger. Um, Stimmung, um, I think, also translates as a kind of like tuning or like tuning into. So there's a certain extent that um, certain emotions um, sort of tune us into reality better than others. Bloch actually thinks that this, that the Stimmung is, um, um, is uh, a little bit underdeveloped. It has to be progressed towards emotions because when it's progressed towards emotions, then it's conscious. And that's kind of good for, uh, uh, for Bloch. Um, I know that might sound like a little bit of a contradiction uh, to the to the idea that it's meant to be a not yet conscious. We will sort of look at that in, in a little bit. Um, so, but what I want to sort of emphasize here is how Bloch talks about hope as um, I've got it in bold a, a basic determination within objective reality as a whole. He also describes hope as a cosmic entity and a functionary of what has never been of the possible new. Um, so. It's amazing. Wonder, it's amazing, by the way, how much he focuses on fear in the introduction. And there's this yes. whole, like, I don't know, you could call it maybe like a genealogy of fear. Yes. And he really does. You're right. I mean, he really does kind of create a kind of um, bifurcation or a dualism or something in these two affects. And I wonder if you could say a little bit more about fear. Like, what is fear for him in a certain way? How do we sort of, how would you sort of condense that for him? I mean, the way... The way that I understand it, if I was to condense it, and this, this may be um, a bit of a crude um, summary that might not 
fully represent everything that Block is saying, but I, I think it, it generally is the idea that, um, you know, we, we hope, you know, we hope and we have these sort of utopian ideas supposedly for us as far as Block is concerned, but then um, we come up against new Gegenstand, new Gegenstand, and then we come up against new uh, barriers, right? And, and we come up against new historical conditions um, that compromise um, the uh, realizability of what we hope for. Um, um, we may we may also um, let's say we're a Christian and we might believe in, in believe in, in heaven or some afterlife. Um, we're well, not even a Christian, sorry. That's um, that's ridiculous. Where there, there are obviously you know many religions more religious um, in, in um, and and you know believe in this idea that there'll be some reward um, after we die. Um, if we suddenly um, get disenchanted with this idea and or or we undergo, um, I mean, Block, Block will later talk about the critical enlightenment. And, and if suddenly we uh, no longer believe in this, then, then we might actually, you know, it could be really sad. It, it can be quite catastrophic, you, can, you know, life, so suddenly, you know, there was no meaning, you know, what, what do we do? Um, so there are certain, there are so many things that um, disappoint us in life that really sort of make hoping, um, believing in betterment um, really difficult. And I think fear is is about like the fear of uh, disappointment to to a large extent. Uh, it's it's um, and and when Bloch is talking about the fear at the start of the principle of hope, I think he's largely talking about um, the fear of the bourgeoisie who are going to lose um, you know lose their way of life. And um, and and Bloch says what what the bourgeoisie want to do is they want to bring everyone else into that fear. They want to show that the fear is universal. They want to say that the fear, that the bourgeoisie's fear is actually what everyone else should be feeling. Yeah. May, may I come in, just butt in for what, uh, butt in is too strong a word, but. <laughs> uh, first of all, this is my first time here. I'm really excited to be here. This is a great space. I can keep on going, but we only have so much time. Um, talking about fear, um, I remember he talks about fear quite a bit in the introduction and you're right, it's fascinating, Daniel. I, I love every second of it. But um, I felt as though the most compelling part of his discourse on fear was when he was specifically specifically talking about like these petite bourgeois people who were middlemen of capital and not having capital themselves or at the very least not having the instruments uh, that facilitate capital. Uh, they are correct in feeling anxious about their conspicuous class positions. Because I would say that this fear is conditioned and emerges from, again, the very real um, uh, recognition that these people do not actually have any means to meaningfully intervene in their own lives, right? And I think that point was uh, very prescient uh, in regards to social relationships today. So uh, yeah, fear is, um, you. Uh, maybe a simple way of putting it is that fear is conditioned and emerges from being fully aware of your conspicuous class position and how just uh, just how ineffectual um, you are in the capitalist modality of production and so on, so. Yeah, uh, thank you. Um, yeah, I mean, like the, sorry. Itai has a comment. Um, yep. Very quickly. Um, this was actually an area where I um, had a question for Bloch's approach. Um, I guess, <laughs> you know, this is a group for psychoanalysis and so hopefully this is not too out of place, but um, I think when I was reading Bloch, I definitely got the feeling that, that, um, in a world where material conditions are different, um, just fear wouldn't play as much of a part in human life. Uh, and that doesn't seem right to me. Um, but now we, we might say that fear shouldn't play as much of a part in our life as it does. Um, but that's a very different claim than the idea that fear will somehow disappear or that horror, maybe in a more meaningfully, that horror will disappear. Um, and I think that, you know, one kind of point of resistance that I had uh, for, for Bloch was thinking about, um, you know, someone like Nieville, right? Um, 
the, the speculative uh, fiction author and how Mieville has kind of played around with all of these tropes of horror, uh, but in a very left-wing way. Um, and I guess I'm not really sure how Bloch would think about someone like that. Um, sorry, Isai, could you repeat the bit about um, Yeovil? Sure. Um, I guess just the thought that came to mind, a question really, um, is you know how would Bloch's approach, um, you know, make sense of the kind of very classed understanding of horror that you find in authors like Mieville? Well, I, I don't, I don't think um, we can. Sorry, someone. Please, if, if someone else has a response, do do. Um, well, input. well, if I may, I would say that horror itself emerges from certain fantasies of like a latent awareness of your material conditions. I would say, um, I mean, Block likes to talk about archetypes, and I have to uh, confess I didn't really get into the archetypal conversation of it. So maybe this is more appropriate and can relate to that. But um, I think this is uh, analogous to uh, an extension of my earlier point of this is why folks are compelled to myth because they do not have a, or, or they are not aware of, a, I'm sorry, a historical correlation that could remedy their material conditions. So not having that historical um, context from which they can draw upon, they are compelled to myth. It's the only thing that they can, can identify as possibly being of help in this situation. So they are grasping at straws and one of those straws is myth. Yeah, yeah. I, I, I definitely think um, one way to understand fear is also through a kind of latent critique of existentialist pessimism in philosophy, which tried to universalize the affect of anxiety in, in a way which for Lukács and Bloch was definitely a kind of mirroring of, of a bourgeois worldview. So that um, worldview Marxist commitment is, I think, at play in the theory of affect as it pertains to, uh, you know, would a subject that, that has sort of adequately altered their orientation to the absolute um, be absent of fear? No, I don't think that they would be absent of fear. I think he actually makes a distinction between a different material educated hope versus false hope. And I think that this is something which we can definitely uh, grasp in our own lives as socialists. I mean, think about the fact that if you are raised in a Christian tradition, you have a kind of God-fearing orientation. You undergo a certain study and you undergo a certain re-understanding of Christianity and you go to the church and you don't feel that fear or guilt. You literally don't. So I think that a kind of socialist horizon absolutely can not extinguish fear, but certainly mediate it, right? I don't think he's naive enough to say that something like some communist revolution would extinguish fear. But I do think he's wanting to say that there's a more robust orientation to a material, materialist version of hope, which will um, not weaponize fear in the way that it is weaponized now, because a lot of what he's talking about is fear as a class weapon and so on. So I don't know if that helps or if you agree, but. I think um, I, I think I think that's I think that's quite a, um, yeah that's that's a good point and I think also um, you know what what Block wants to uh, wants us to say is that you know it, you know if we have abstract um, ideals if we have abstract hope like the kind of hope and the kind of ideals that as we if we get time we might see later need to be sort of corrected Block wants to say that underlying those is is fear and fear is a shame that that you know that's um, when I say a shame I mean fear is. Um, what I really meant to say was that fear is, you know, doesn't have to be accepted, that we don't have to resign ourselves to a state of, of fear. I think, you know, Bloch is sort of saying that, um, um, you know, the, the, the extent to which our ideals are abstract is the extent to which we are, you know, perhaps not very well. Um, yeah. And I also, we, think, I also think, Joshua, you could say something that would help Itai's uh, contention, which would be like, think about what um, the affect theorists talk about with like false optimism. And, and like all of like Sarah Ahmed's critique of um, what does she call it? This disciplined optimism, right? That elicits a certain anxiety that elicits a certain pervasive fear. And even the mantra of, 
of um, of Obama's version of hope has a certain fear uh, 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 laced within it. Speaking as yeah. someone who was who was a part of that, right? <laughs> Yeah, I, I, also, I also don't think uh, that, you know, that, that fear is like, it's, I don't think fear is like, it is, you know, it's is as much as a problem as maybe Block is sort of making it out to be. The, the problem for Block is that fear in itself is not necessarily, like fear alone, um, I guess, is not as, it's not as effective for change. Like that, that's, I think that's really largely Block's point is that fear is not as effective as hope for um, changing, you know, what we are scared of. Right, like we have to have hope gives us the morale, and I guess, um, um, and um, I, I guess to sort of uh, tarry <laughs> to tarry with the negative, as Hegel would say. Um, I th think, um, and I have a and, and oh, sorry. sorry, sorry, no, I didn't mean to interrupt you, I just had a question because, like, uh, just as I'm coming to this, as like. Uh, mostly someone who's interested in psychoanalysis, right? Like Lacan's, af you know, Lacan's you or aphorism, the affect, the only af anxiety is the only affect that doesn't lie, right? And how I think that we're making this distinction of fear and Joan Komchak has this wonderful essay in um, Lacan, the silent partners called May 68, the emotional month. And she makes a fundamental distinction between guilt and shame as two like relations of fear or, anxiety she calls it moral anxiety and like shame anxiety and these are the two and that the, the more fundamental re relation to affect or the one affect that doesn't escape into these conceptions of the past that i think that we're you know wrestling with here is shame and that is the cons um you know injunction to the university students after 68 is like you should feel ashamed and you know the you know uh, famously the mat you want a master you'll get one but nevertheless like it, i'm wondering here is there a fundamental bifurcation between or is there a dichotomy between guilt and shame is that operable and is how is block blocks block sorry how is his um interpretation of hope not just a reinscription of a, a, a failure to live up to a past you know uh, that's the question I'm wrestling with right now. Yeah, like, I, I, think it's, I think it's. Can I can I make the suggestion that we um, that we maybe um, bear in mind these questions and and bring them to the next session where we will be looking at blocks. Um, Block will talk a lot about emotions there. Nice. But I think I think your point, um, uh, John, is that. Um, sorry, was it John who just spoke? I can't actually <laughs> see. Um, that's that's um, me. Yeah. Yes, yeah, sorry, John. Um, I, yeah, and I, I think I think you've made a very important point there. The question is like, what 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 emotion is most conducive to um, not being, um, I guess, um, sort of bound by um, reified or sort of fixed things? It, it, does that make sense? Does that sort of make sense, John? Yeah, like I guess, yeah. That my question is, how do we are not bound to the the the, the overflow of history of time, like yeah. that we are not just riven to our ancestors in some meaning, yeah, like, and and like beholden to them to some meaningful way. Yeah. How is there a new in that? That's a perfect point, and 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 um and and I'm going to sort of go into that a little bit now, and I, and I will say, um, you know, th this is a really important question for Heidegger, right? So for Heidegger, what's so interesting, what's so important about angst, is that um, unlike fear angst uh, does not have an object or it does not have a specific object for block um this is also going to be quite important um we will look at the difference between hope and angst and fear um uh in the in the sort of the reading of the next session but i would just maybe um if it's okay with you guys i will uh, carry on to talk about um how block thinks that hope is most is 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 best positioned for this and um um so for block um th these are just this you know these are blocks um this is blocks conception of hope we might not agree with this conception of hope if we don't agree with this conception of hope then we might want to um 
we consider what, what emotion is most conducive to this. But for Bloch, what's important about hope is that um, it, it, it um, and this, this is what I'm going to describe, um, and I think what Bloch also intends as hope's epistemic function. For Bloch, nothing is closed off from hope. It's concerned with everything. If, if hope is so optimistic, then it wants to change everything, it's going to be concerned with everything. And not only that, um, not only is hope going to be concerned with the uh, totality, it's also going to want to uh, uh, change things and, and it's going to want to go beyond, it's, it's going to want to uh, speculate, but it's only going to want to speculate on the basis of what has already become. You know, it's, it's optimistic about what is there already. And this may be a little bit of a tension in block. We might want to consider whether um, there's a tension um, between the extent to which hope wants to do things imminently and the extent to which um, hope, um, well, Bloch, I think, describes somewhere um, um, as, um, I think he describes the utopian function as something like transcendent without, it, it's transcendent without being, or well, it's transcending without being transcendent or something like that. I can't remember how he, how he words it, but there is a certain extent to which, you know, I, I've alluded to um, when we are talking about the non-synchronism uh, text, I was talking about, you know, certain things being trans-historical and, and this incompleted past as being something, a surplus, which, which is, is carried over and will continue to be carried over until it's dealt with uh, sufficiently. Um, so hope, I think, you know, well, for Bloch, it does have this epistemic function. It, it's, it's, it is like the emotion that's most conducive to um, a comprehensive sort of dialectics because of its concern with totality and imminence. Um, and um, a really sort of nice sharp uh, quote, uh, which I, which um, appears in the on on uh, on Karl Marx uh, book, which is uh, included in the Dropbox, uh, is um, enthusiasm assists sobriety. Hope gives us a. Uh, uh, to some extent, the courage to tarry with the negative, to face cold hard facts, uh, because hope believes that those hot, cold hard facts, you know, can change. Um, whereas, um, and 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 perhaps we might want to think about um, whether or not fear and angst are uh, bound to pessimism and resignation. Um, you know, um, whether or not we believe that might. Um, might influence how we uh, think about um, an emotion that's conducive to uh, going beyond uh, being bound to um, fixed aspects of our history, you know, um, you know, unchangeable, this idea of things in our history being unchangeable. Um, um, so yeah, I mean, I, I, I think, I think I'll go to the next slide because, um, because, because the extent to which, um, hope it has this epistemic function uh, has to do with the not yet conscious for for block the not yet conscious um well this is how he describes it he, he describes the not yet conscious as a relatively still unconscious uh disposed towards its other side forwards rather than backwards towards the side of something new that is dawning up that has never been conscious before not for example something forgotten something rememberable that has been something that has sunk into the subconscious in repressed or archaic fashion. So John, that might, um, I feel like this gets at um, what you were talking about uh, to a certain extent, forgive me if I've misunderstood, um, but um, for Bloch, this aspect of the not yet conscious um, is most effective when it's, it's hopeful. Like the effectiveness of our not yet conscious um, is the extent to which it is optimistic, uh, to which we are optimistic. Um, and, and the not yet conscious um, palpates reality. Um, I don't know if any of you have read, um, is it Stephen Shaviro who writes about uh, the slime mold? I mean, it, it sort of reminds me of, of this, you know, this, this idea that we sort of palpate reality um, in a pre-conscious manner. Um, and, um, and, 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 you know, the not yet conscious is, 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 is the way that we cognize, um, initially we cognize uh, the Gegenstand because um, the Gegenstand is, is unformed. And, and so long as it is unformed, it's very difficult to, um, it's, it's, it's very difficult to be sort of cognized in the, um, in, the, um, in the usual sort of conventional sense of, of being able to have um, our objective knowledge that is amenable to justification and and uh, and so on 
Um, does that make sense? Is there anything that anyone wants to comment on this? I mean, we can, I, I know that uh, um, Daniel is especially sort of interested in, in looking at the not yet conscious. So is there anything we want to um, uh, question here or talk uh, about? I really like that point that the affect of hope, and I think it's helpful to call hope a principle, but also call it an affect, is useful precisely because it helps us think totality. I think that's such an important point. Uh, mm. Because this uh, places Locke, again, in, in the camp of the kind of Lukacian Marxism, where a thinking of totality is of, of, of central importance, right? So it, it's a, yes. it's a, therefore, um, Interesting also that all of kind of um, Bloch's relationships with other prominent Marxists, they all tended to recognize that, that like he was, he was right about this. He's right about that point. And I think that his correctness there has to do with um, the difficulty of collective thinking of totality. And I would love to just tease that out more and kind of see what you think about this notion of, of um, of a thinking of a totality. I mean, I'm thinking here of even like um, cartographies of the absolute and all of this kind of contemporary Marxist problematic that was opened up by Frederick Jameson, which is a post lukacian problematic, by the way, uh, which um, Alberto Toscano has also taken up, right? So there's like still this thread of Marxist thinking, which recognizes that in our contemporary milieu, that a kind of project of totality is somehow paradoxically, I would say, off the table. Whereas in the block period, the class struggle was composed in such a way that like, you know, it was on the table, I suppose. You know what I mean? Mm -hmm. And uh, that, that actually makes me even think also that even the Zizek Thompson art, uh, book on the privatization of hope, the private. Mm of hope uh, indicates a nice collapse of hope in relation to totality. And yeah, it, I think that's good. yeah, you know what I mean? And then again, the paradox being that, okay, in the age of globalization, in the collapse of kind of this, um, even philosophies of difference and alterity feel foreign to us, right? We don't talk about them anymore like we used to. Um, we're, we have a kind of strange flattening in some weird way of of the of the capitalist system the the world interior to capital yet we still can't put totality on the table <laughs> does that make sense like it's very maddening in a certain way i'm 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 rambling here but i'll stop well i, I feel like um uh, yeah, maybe perhaps someone else has, has uh, something to say about this but i feel like itai your um sort of you know you're quite interested in this sort of question of totality and the difference between totality and the and the one and the whole um do you, is there anything that you have to say about this especially sort of you know since we're also bringing up Lukács? um i to be honest my neighbor just knocked on my door and like insisted that i come out and talk to him for a second so uh, i missed a little bit of your point earlier daniel um so i, I i'm not sure i could say anything to uh, intelligible at the moment. Oh, no worries. No worries. Oh, um, um, I was gonna, if I could say something. Um, yeah, Daniel was talking about totality and um, you kind of, hopefully this is analogous, but I think that's very interesting in how it is that Block is approaching totality here. Um, earlier in your presentation, you uh, were talking about how Block rubs shoulders with Walter Benjamin, right? And I feel as though this is a great way to kind of elucidate just how different his approach is, right? Because there are certain points during this where, uh, well, just to put it simply, like this essay is very much evocative of Benjamin's thesis on the philosophy of history. But there's certain points I was reading this and I'm just like, say the angel of history, just say it. You know, he's like talking about the same thing. But um, no, it's, no, really, like they're both using historical materialism as a framework but they're also staging their essays and saying, and their projects and saying that, sure, historical material, materialism is great, but we need something else. We need a supplemental analysis of an ontology of something in the thesis of philosophy of history. Of course, he's talking about historical materialism being supplemented with something like theology, right? Mm -hmm. But this approach to totality, I think in Benjamin is 
much more specific. He is specifically talking about uh, redeeming proletarian history because the conditions of capitalism have led the proletariats to mis misrecognize whether it's proletarian history or just history, period. Um, uh, Benny means talking about we have to disillusion ourselves from this. And uh, John was talking about, are we duty bound or this or that? I think Benny Mean even says at one point, like it is our duty to resurrect like the history of proletarian movements and this and that. But this is what I mean by the different approaches towards totality. Block, it seems as though is saying that not just proletarian history, we can find revolutionary potential in the utopic function that is at, that is at work in all cultural productions. Right. Yeah, there are other histories to but, be redeemed. Well, but this well, is what I mean, right? Because uh, we need to, if that is true, then I think we need to be a little precise here because if the utopic function is everywhere, then if it's everything, then what is it? Of course, I'm being a little obtuse here. And Bloch even says at the end of his introduction, I know this might be a little hard to get. I'm going to keep re repeating this point until you guys get it. So, uh, yeah. yeah, at the very least, I would like to stage your, your argument and, uh, if you could just repeat it a couple more times for me so I can get it, because it's still a little uh, ambiguous. What exactly is the utopic function, right? Yeah, no, I, I agree. That's a, that's a really good question. I, I, think, um, I, think, I think for Bloch, you know, utopian function is to a certain extent um, sort of, is this a certain extent behind everything? But Bloch is quite specific about what utopian function is. For Bloch, Utopian function is the extent to which the not yet conscious has become um, has become conscious, and the way that the not yet conscious becomes conscious is through ideas. At first, this is through uh, subjective or imaginary ideas, um, which in German is often, I think, uh, captured by the word uh, Vorstellung, Vorstellungen, um, and then these ideas sort of get progressed, um, or you know, sort of get get formalized and, and for block um um what what you know what, re what really matters what's at stake in an educated hope is um is uh, developing these ideas um and along with sort of what's already happening uh, uh happening in history so the utopian function gets um gets blocked it, it gets um compromised um and then has to get picked up again has to get relayed so not so you know everything so so no I, I think I get what you're saying because it seems as though like the classic Marxist uh analysis would say that ideologically is materially conditioned right and in that way art objects and cultural productions would emerge themselves from certain ideological sentiments and presuppositions etc cetera, etc cetera. but yeah. uh, I think this is kind of what Bloch is driving at is that ideology itself has an element of hope within it but uh, yes. that hope yes. may itself be a false hope. And I think part of his project is kind of trying to disillusion ourselves from what that false hope is and find what the actual, now this is a hard bit, what is that actual, um, the actual hopeful affordances that are impressed upon that art object. So okay. it seems if, like, I guess what I'm trying to drive at is that I think he takes it as a given that hope itself is a definite aspect of human nature and perhaps yes. in that way that's what we're supposed to be eliciting from our yes. object yes yes so block block what block is asking um, asking us to accept or what block thinks that we must accept is that so long as there are problems in reality so long as people are ill so long as um there's hardship and, and things are bad those people are going to hope for betterment of some kind and so um so so how ideology works is um, it has to, it has to, um, it has to represent to people the idea that um, what they can hope for is um, is either, uh, or at least the best they can hope for um, is already within the social conditions themselves, or they absolutely transcend them. Right? I mean, there are other. Um, there are some nuances to this, which we will hopefully sort of, we might we, we might look at, um, but but I, but um, um, but but, but I, I'm I'm actually um the next couple of slides deal with this, so maybe we should um may I just one thing? Sorry, y'all. Sorry, Joshua. With regards to the utopian function, you said bring it up as maybe 
something that's like it's if it's everywhere if it's in all sort of if it's imminent in just processes of life and becoming or just being human then what is it what it what it's not concrete so is it just something that's everywhere and, and nowhere but i mean i guess in in this society in the client there really doesn't seem like if it's everywhere where we don't see it there is not really a lot of utopian functioning going on i don't see a lot of utopian thinking or hoping well, except I, I, I think, I think it's really oh, wait wait wait, wait. Sorry. well block would say that you're just capitalism pilled you know that you have to you have to liberate your mind man like of course i'm yeah. being facetious but Yes, yes, in a way, it has to first start, you know, by sort of bringing out of just a contemplative sort of orientation towards it, or bringing it out of just like a feeling of it, which is what this quote here is saying, is where the utopian function is hope, but it's not just hope as an emotion. So hope is everywhere, sort of, for Ernst, but hope as the utopian function, which is sort of imminent, is hope that is in known, in known in a conscious way or hope that it's not just like contemplative or contemplated yeah. hope, but hope that you participate in, like participatory reason, the way I think he says it. So it's sort yeah, of- Yeah, yeah. Well, I, I, think, think I think that's what we're, we're driving at, right? It's this not yet conscious. It's that we have like participated in utopic functions, but we are not yet, uh, we have not yet brought that experience to mind, right? That's how that's I appreciate the not yet conscious, but- And if a function is that which relates the output the input to the output then the utopian function it will be that pivot point that we sort of do have to as you say like bring into like the foreconscious more this, easily accessible not this just is something that i was trying to i'm sorry i'm talking a lot already but this is something that i was trying to work out um if it is true that the utopic function is like imbued upon like an art object or this or that does that mean it is already at work within broader society or is it that the utopic function has to be activated in that object through the proper recognition to, of what that is? To, I think that's an interesting distinction to make. I think, I think my understanding is that we have to self-fulfill uh, a utopian function. And I think maybe um, I confused things by at the start, I think I described everything as being like a utopian function, uh, maybe conflated utopian function with the idea of reality being in, in process. I think, I think, I think there might be I guess I'm a little bit unclear about that myself. So it might be something that, you know, that I guess that might be my question uh, that, I, that I'm sort of trying to grapple with. But I certainly think this quote here um, from the principle of hope suggests um, that, you know, the, utop the utopian function is, is something, um, you know, it, it's, not, it's not a given, like it has to be self-fulfilled. And, um, and, and what utopian function is, um, um, it's about, uh, well, Block says here, only when reason starts to speak does hope in which there is no guile, uh, uh, does hope, sorry, in which there is no guile uh, begin to blossom again. The not yet conscious itself must become conscious in its act, known in its content, as the process of dawning on the one hand as what is dawning on the other. And so the point is reached where hope itself no longer just appears as merely self, a self-based mental feeling but in a conscious known way as utopian function. So I think utopian function is to a certain extent um, discrete. It's, it's not, um, it, you know, it appears here and there. It, it's, um, it's, um, it's really, uh, it self fulfills, I guess, the transition uh, from the, what has become to, to, the, uh, to the new. Um, you know, it, it, I, you know it, again, it, it's really, I guess that's the extent to which it really isn't like, um, you know, it really isn't like, um, but I was going to say this might be the extent to which it really isn't like Deleuze is becoming or something, but I, but I think that could be um, misleading. But I, I do think it's, it's the idea that, um, that yeah, okay, reality may be in process, things may be coming up, things may be dawning, as, as Bloch says, but in a way we sort of have to self-fulfill those, uh, fulfill those dawnings. We have to, we, you know, maybe have to accelerate them. Um, um, and, and the way that we can do that is is by making them conscious known. And, and when Block talks about being conscious in, in our act, uh, or, or in hope, or the not yet conscious is conscious in this act, we might think about this in terms of the um, or the class consciousness of the proletariat, or, you know, of being aware of its own labour. Um, and then also, um, you know, about knowing where is it tending towards, where um, I think this may be what, what, uh, what, is, what is being um, talked about. Um, does that make sense? 
does that clear up anything? Does that clarify anything? I mean, it, it, it's okay if it doesn't. Um, I think you, you were both sort of and you know, um, asking some sort of like posing some quite important and significant questions there, which I've sort of grappled with myself. But does this clear up anything? Um, if I may, uh, to try and like bring it a bit more concrete in the way I think about it is, so the, there's a there's a truth in for block. There's a truth in every false. So that's why he focuses on myth and religion a lot. So, so in every in every what was the term you used in every what? False. So in everything. Every false. false. Okay. Yep. Okay. Yeah. So um. So when you think of religion, you'll see in the in Christianity. He will talk about the son of God in the Bible of the um, elites in the church and the, the son of man in the Bible of the people. And so the son of man, Jesus as the son of man, is the, is the truth within the false. So within the myth, which is why he pushes against back, back against mechanical materialism that he says overcomes the false myth, but then descends back into myth because they forget about the warm stream that is already yeah. within the Bible. Um, yeah. And so if you want to go to something really concrete, I think, because he's got a book on natural law, it's good to look at natural law in terms of the bourgeois revolution, the French revolution. So he'll say the utopian, the tricolour was utopian. It was hopeful. But then when it become actualized, because Rousseau had introduced private property into natural law, it descended into a form of myth and what was utopian fraternity freedom i've forgotten the third one and so on is is no longer because it's built on private property but nevertheless yeah, those cool. ideals yeah. those ideals themselves do not lose their utopian function so we have to rescue yeah. them and bring them forward and that's why he doesn't give up that's, that's why he's an unorthodox Marxist, because he doesn't give up the Bible and he doesn't give up natural law, where the orthodox Marxists just see that as pure ideology. Um, exactly. That, that's that's a really, yeah, that's a really important point. Thank you so much, Matthew. And and that's kind of, well, sorry, that was Matthew was speaking just then, wasn't it? Um, I am, yeah, I, I'm sort of sliding. Um, you, can, you can probably see because my screen is shared. I'm sort of sliding to see who's talking. But um, so, yeah, I mean, um, and that's sort of what we're going to uh, lead into. Um, um, well, that's sort of what I had and sort of intended to talk about next, actually. So thank you, Matthew. It's, it's you know, as, as Matthew was saying, like uh, there were certain aspects of ideology that Bloch wants to um, sort of salvage in a way. Like he, he describes um, he, he describes how um, the, the way that um, ideology functions is that it um, it tends to um, um, embellish. Um, so instead, instead of sort of like, instead of like tarrying with the, uh, with each, with the tar instead of tarrying with like the uh, trajectory of the utopian function, it just, it just embellishes what, what um, you know, what is already existing instead. So um, it just represents reality as kind of like somehow already completed, or it represents like all the subjective desires, um, uh, of the utopian function is kind of like already um, uh, uh, completed or already, um, I guess, um, uh, or, or, or it's kind of like fixes it in terms of like specific ideas, right? Whether that is, you know, that might even be like Kant's idea of like the regulative ideal, right? We may continue to strive towards a regulative ideal, but it, that ideal itself is, is not really going to change. It's not ever really going to be, um, um, you know, it's it's not um, it's not actually going to be ever be sort of mediated with reality itself. But um, but for Bloch, there are certain elements in this um, embellishment. There's certain elements in ideology that are irreducible to false consciousness. And I think um, um, the whole point about what, what, you could, know, you, could you go back well, just quickly? Sorry, I missed the very last point. Um, well, um, yeah, the, the last uh, the last point that I have in the slide actually is a little bit different. Is that what you mean about by false consciousness, about falsely concluding harmonization? Is that? Um, yes, to a, yes, to a certain extent. I, I think there are different um, kinds of falsely concluded harmonization because there's aspects of this that Bloch thinks are salvageable. There are aspects which embellish what Bloch calls embellishes the badly existing. So that is like a false consciousness, right? Um, um, 
um, you know, like, I guess, you know, so long as there is a possibility for a different world or a different form of society, um, telling people that the, um, that the best they're going to get is already within, you know, capitalism or, or feudalism or, or whatever, whatever social relations are, are um, um, have, whatever form the social relations have taken at the time, you know, if you tell people that's, a, that the, best, that's the best you're going to get, um, then, you know, that's sort of, you know, that's, just, well, it, it can be deception. If it's done consciously, um, which, um, uh, you know, that, that will be deception. But, um, but it really is um, largely uh, because of class interest, um, uh, it usually isn't an intended deception. Right? It's um, like the, I think like the ruling classes, I think what Bloch agrees with Marx that the ruling classes do really, um, at least the ideologists of the ruling class do really want to think that <laughs> that their society is in the is in universal interest. It just isn't. So I wonder. I wonder if the 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 um, the the uh, uh, the form of false consciousness here that is negating the utopian dimension is it disavowing the utopian dimension? Is it um, functioning as a kind of um, a covering over? As a as an uh, occluding of it, yes. Uh, Block Bloch describes it as yes. Bloch, Bloch describes it as a breaking off, um, and and I, and I think all of the words that you've just sort of used there sort of you know are quite helpful and sort of get at the same thing. Um, mm. Yeah, I think I think it is a sort of disavowal, um, mm. um, but I think it is important to know that um, that that for Block, you know, it is to do with um, you know the historical conditions just not being um right or not being in place to 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 carry on the utopian functions trajectory like that you know um cold hard reality really does just get in the way but we have to maintain the hope uh, that things can change and that things will change otherwise we won't be um you know i describe i talked about the utopian i uh, sorry i talked about the epistemic function of optimism if we don't have this optimism for as far as block is concerned we're not really um sort of well disposed to to look out for uh new opportunities or, or changes yeah. um so that makes sense yeah yeah it does it does i mean it's interesting also to think about this like as a principle as a so block is a committed communist and like there's a kind of sense in which um communistic principles possess in a certain sense a kind of um I wouldn't I wouldn't use the term pure, but like if you think of like Beju's notion of communist theory of invariance, the idea of Munzer was important because Munzer expressed an anti-property demand. So it's like this primordial demand for equality, like a, a, a form of equality which is impossible, you could say, right? But then that impossibility becomes as the bourgeois society advances something which we always tether with and we always go back to and so on as the unfulfilled point right you see my yes point. yeah that's the, that's the incompleted past and it's like even, of... even in munzer the 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 um uh the three demands of french revolution freedom egalitarianism and liberty and so on are just uh, uh, merely expressions of that more primordial is that kind of a way to think about it in a, in a sense um, yeah, I, th I think to a certain extent, like, um, like, I think what you're getting at there is, is we, I, I had intended to talk about the ideal, but I don't think we're going to get uh, time to talk about the ideal in this session, we might have to come back to that in the, la in the last session, but, uh, but for Bloch, um, you know, uh, we can have these ideals, so long as they're oriented towards the future, and so long as we're revising them, um, and, and, and so long as we intend to mediate them with reality, uh, that's all fine and good, uh, but they can get they need to get concretized, right? They need to be given their content, the contents of these ideals need to be specified. And um, if we take about, if, if we look at the highest good, for example, for Bloch, the highest good, um, which, uh, you know, which predates Marx, predates Kant, like it's, it, um, you know, it's, it's, you know, even predates Rousseau to a certain extent, um, you know, the highest good um, for Bloch is like the, is, is what, is what like, we are aiming for it's what the it's kind of what the absolute is aiming for you know um and the highest good um for block over over time gets um 
gets specified. Um, and um, within, so he talks about how uh, the highest good, um, he, well, he sort of alludes to the idea that the highest good um, has to get dealt with within specific domains. And within the domain of like socio, well, within the domain of like politics and, and society, the highest good becomes for Bloch um, the classless society, right? When we think about this concretely, um, then um, the highest hope is really about a classless um, society, and um, and um, things like uh, freedom, uh, egality, and and, um, and, and fraternity um, are required to specify what the contents of um, uh, of uh, the highest good uh, should be, and 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 sorry, I feel like I'm talking about the highest good as, as if you guys um, know what that, know what that is. Um, in case nobody um, is familiar with the highest good, it's um, it, um, it, it appears in in, um, in in different philosophers, but Kant understood it as the um, as the combination of virtue with um, or with uh, happiness, or at least dessert for happiness. Um, so yeah, does, does that re does that relate, Daniel? Is that relevant? Yeah, no, no, talking? no, 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 totally. I'm I'm just trying to get a grasp on um, um, the utopian function and its um, instantiation in the world, and 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 just sort of the way that um, the it, as a principle, it has to have qualifications, and so that oh, then, yeah, sure. oh, sure. then that then makes it very very interesting, right? Like. Like a uh, liberal hope is not um, is not adequate to the type of hope that we're talking here. There's a gradient. Exactly. Right? It has to be related. Deterritorialization is not what Bloch is is getting at. Right? Exactly. Yeah. yeah. So then, yeah. When, you, when you imply that, then you do have to bring in these kind of yeah, you have to bring in kind of Kantian categories, and even the regulative idea there is interesting because um, I always think a nice way to talk about regulative ideas like. Um, a form of thought which enlightenment uh, cannot solve becomes a regulative idea in a certain sense is, is one way to to think about it like in other words it becomes um, something which governs a kind of zone of unthinkability in some way right because where reason has it is at the precipice of its limits you, you then have the emergence of something like regulative ideal or regulative idea but then, but then, but then you're introducing the contrast between an ideal and the function of hope, which is a whole other thing we need to break down. I don't know if we can do that tonight with a few um, minutes. Left. Well, yeah, I mean, I mean, I feel like we kind of do. Do, do we think we have like a, a a kind of good enough understanding of what educated hope means? Like, you know, like the necessity to revise our ideals, like to to kind of survey. I mean, Block describes us here as uh, a combined research into objective tendency and subjective intention like it's kind of a research project to go back and look at the history um, and you know look at culture and look at all of these ideals and um you know um and not, not just ideals uh, block will look at other things like archetypes um and it, if i can and, just jump um, in really quickly um of course i just wanted to uh kind of challenge this idea that i think you mentioned earlier that block's project is not invested in deterritorialization and I don't think that's immediately obvious, um, especially when we consider that, and this is something I was thinking about, he says time and time again, a couple of times throughout some of our readings that uh, this, in, this project is invested in a return to homeland. Um, and when he says that, I'm curious if he is thinking of a like specific plot of land and so on, or if this is a more uh, ethereal homeland, a kind of return to uh, a natural relations that are not we are not alienated, et cetera, et cetera. I think you get my point. But also I would challenge the idea that he's not invested in detorialization because I think part of his project is invested in detour de I can't say this word, deterritorializing uh, certain art objects which are believed to be um, specifically for intended for certain cl classes of people. So insofar as classes itself uh, determined by placing people, orienting people in society, um, I think certainly this project is in part invested in deterritorializing de things. Uh, yeah, so. I, think, I, think, I, think that's a, I think that's an important, important point, Con. I, I, I think I should specify that when, when I was um, saying that Block, you know, it blocks um, 
utopian function and, and educated hope is not about um, deterritorialization. I think what I was what I was really trying to get at is it's not like the it's not the Nietzschean idea of armor fati as as such, right? It's it's not just um, and and perhaps maybe I'm I'm causing more problems by saying that. Um, but I I think it's not about it's it's not about the new the new is not valued um, in itself. Right, I, I, th I think I think um, I think Block may talk about that, and if it and and, and where he does maybe allude to that, I think it, it's um, it, it's kind of a, it, it introduces a problem or a certain you know a certain possible inconsistency within Block's thought. I think you know uh, you know Block is not um, you know Block wants to deal with dialectics here, so so I think it's about um, Deterritorialization, deterritorialization, and reterritorialization to a certain extent. Um, I'm, I'm sure. Um, like, I guess a, a more, more, more easier way to formulate my question, a simple way to formulate it, would be: Is Block invested in reclaiming things, or is he invested in abolishing claims altogether? In a kind no, of like I anarchist. No, I think, in, I think it's about reclaiming things. Right? It's about revising things. I, I think. I think you know, Block is. Um, I think you know if you're familiar with, with Deleuze and Guattari, you might be probably familiar with the idea of like you know being cautious when experimenting on the plane of consistency. And I think um, you know um, I think that's right. I, I, I think I think though for Bloch, uh, caution is like rational. Uh, it's, it's largely rational and it's largely sort of dialectical. Are there any um. I mean, what, what I mean, what I mean, what do you guys think think of that? I mean, um... just just quickly, you mentioned the homeland. Um, Genesis is at the end for Block, and that's because the human is at the center. That's why he's a humanist. And so, when we reclaim, we are reclaiming the ideals or utopian traces of the past to create something new and move into the new aeon not from from the old so that's why genesis is at the end and we reach the homeland at the end the homeland that we have created which is the classless unalienated society um and then from there that's kind of the first stage and then from there he move we move on because as you as josh has pointed out hope and this hunt drive and hunger for hope doesn't really have an end point Unless we become, I think, immortal, he he writes about death and immortality a bit, but um, yeah, we probably won't get into that. Um, if that makes sense. Sorry. Yeah, I I, I, th I think I think the problem I think the problem is maybe the word return, right? Um, sorry, I feel like someone was about to. Um, yeah, I was just going to add something to what um, Matthew just said. Um, I'm not sure if this is helpful, um, but in case it is, um. My understanding of Bloch's use of homeland is that it's this kind of reclamation of the romantic way of talking about the Heimat. Um, the, I'm, maybe I'm saying that word wrong. Um, you know, the, the, you find that very much in like Novalis, people like that. Um, and so I think Bloch is uh, taking that idea from romanticism and kind of transforming it in a way. And, and also Holderlin too. I mean, it's not just romanticism. It's also something in German idealism as well, I think. Yeah, I mean, we could say Holderlin probably is a romantic in some sense, but that's a different discussion. Uh, uh, yeah, yeah, maybe. Okay, we have reached um, two hour mark. Um, you wanna, should we just kind of wrap with like the next two, three minutes just to be kind of good for time and everything, Josh? Um, can I end on a quote? You bet. This has been great, by the way, you've done such a, really um, excellent job and the conversation has been super robust thank you thank you daniel and um yeah and, and thank you everyone for um for attending it, it it really is um it really is great um <clears throat> um this is a quite a long quote um so please feel free to sign off if this is <laughs> if you get bored but um but i i think this is just quite a, a nice quote um so uh, block says when marx says that the working class has no ideals to realize this anathema certainly does not apply to the realization of tendentially concrete goals, but only to that of abstractly introduced goals of ideals which have no contact with history and process. Um, perhaps that's uh, that's it. I think that's a we to maybe. Um, I'm, I'm not sure if I need to read the rest of the quote. 
Um, do it, do it. I, um, okay. Through Marx and Lenin, socialism has itself become a concrete ideal in each further stage to be pursued, an ideal which through its systematically mediated solidity spurs us on not less, but more than the ideal which was abstract and precisely the highest political ideal, the realm of freedom as political summum bonum is so little alien to consciously manufactured history that as a concrete realm, it constitutes the finality of that history or the last chapter of the history of the world. Because an anti summum bonum or in vain, the equally possible alternative would not be the last chapter of this history, but rather its deletion and not finality, but exit to chaos. In process, there is either death without hinterland, despite human work, or there is, by virtue of human work, realism of the ideal in its operation. Tertium non datur. I don't speak Latin, so sorry. Um, but the activity and the separate ideal of the freedom of the utopian function consists in objectively signifying and setting free the not yet become being as ideal, the highest good, which develops with real possibility and dawnings on the front of the process world. So hopefully we'll sort of get to touch upon um, this idea of the concrete ideal um, later on, especially in the last session where we will look at um, eschatology um, and, you know, this idea of like the realized ideal. Can you imagine writing such like glorious sentences on a friggin' typewriter? How hard that would be? be like, <laughs> such like such like a physical exertion. My God, we're so lucky to have laptops. Fuck. It's really beautiful <laughs> writing, though. For, for a Marxist, man, it's like some of the best writing I've ever encountered. Yeah. I think this this is what makes block so compelling, and I think it's very easy to come up against you know sort of things that are quite um, I guess repelling in, in in block like certain concepts that seem sort of you know pre critical, um, but then you know when you sort of read sentences like this, so, sorry, it's not sentence when you read sort of you know um, extracts uh, from blocks work like this, it 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 really spurs you on <laughs> to keep going and to fulfill that utopian function. Um, <clears throat> Yeah. Okay. Thank you all so much. Great first session. Um, reach out with any questions. Joshua, thanks for your uh, insights and your, your energy. And it's like 2.30. It's 2 a.m.? 3 a.m.? Uh, uh, 3 a.m. Amazing. Yeah. Bravo, man. Uh, all the best, everybody. We'll see you one week. Yep. Thanks, everyone. Thank you. Take care, everyone.